Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this time. We ask that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would teach us your word. Teach us the, the book of James, Lord, and we thank you uh, for your faithfulness. We thank you uh, for this book that is so practical for the faith. And Lord, we ask that you would guide us and bless us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we are in the book of James. And James is a wonderful book because it's very practical, very practical. It's full of exhortation and uh, for the things that we need to do uh, as Christians. And the book is wonderful also because it teaches us uh, that we're saved by grace through faith, not good works. But if we truly are saved, we will have good works. And it deals with subjects that we love so much, like trials and tribulations. Don't we love those? <laughs> I haven't gotten there yet, but uh, I'm much better than I used to be. Uh, but uh, it's a wonderful book, and it's uh, written by the Holy Spirit through his servant James, who was the brother of Jesus, who was the brother of Jesus. Now, Jesus was born of Mary when she was a virgin, but Mary, after she had Jesus, had normal sexual relations with her husband, Joseph, just like any other marriage, and there's nothing to be ashamed of. God created sex, and it's a beautiful thing between a man and a woman in marriage. And it's not between men and men. It's not between women and women, even though today so many say that that's fine, but that's sin. And uh, God wants to forgive any sin if you want to repent. He loves us. That's why he died for us on the cross and that he rose from the dead. Um, but we do need to repent. And James is referred to in the scripture as James the Younger. And again, he's the half-brother of Jesus. And uh, something that's very important to understand is that uh, Jesus had many other brothers and sisters. And uh, the way that we know that, that it's physical and not like the Catholics say, that they say that they're spiritual brothers and sisters. He had actual brothers and sisters in his family because there's a passage which says, isn't this the carpenter's son? Physical. Aren't these his brothers and sisters? Physical. So he did have brothers and sisters. Now, Mary uh, was a virgin again when she had Jesus. Uh, he, she was impregnated by the Holy Spirit. And uh, Joseph was not Jesus' father, but Mary was his mother. And so we need to understand uh, what Scripture actually teaches about the virgin birth. It did happen, but uh, Jesus did have brothers and sisters later. And so we begin um, with James 1.1. 1, 1. It says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, first of all, we see that James says that he's a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus. Now, you don't put God and the Lord Jesus in the same sentence if Jesus is not God. I wouldn't say a servant of God and Ken. <laughs> oh, you left me out of the room. No, uh, and he says, of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is God. Scripture teaches that he is God. And in this passage, it's uh, he is on the par with God in this scripture. Another proof that, of the deity of Jesus Christ. And what's so wonderful about the term bondservant, it's a slave by choice. It's a, ch it's a slave by love. And so in the Old Testament, what would happen is that if you had a debt and you were in Israel and you were a Jewish person and you couldn't pay your debt, you could pay your debt by being a slave to that person. But the longest period of time that you could would be seven years. And after that, you would have to be set free. But if you decided, I love my master, he's so good to me, I don't want to leave, I love my master, I want to continue uh, serving my master with a bond of love. And that is the example here of James calling himself a bond servant of Jesus Christ, that we serve him out of love. And that's a beautiful thing. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, the family of Jesus did not believe in him until after his resurrection. They even thought that maybe he was out of his mind, which is an interesting thing. But afterwards, obviously, James did. He was one of the early leaders in the church. And in Acts chapter 15, when they had a dispute whether or not Gentiles could be saved, God used him to teach that, yes, 
they could be saved and that they did not have to keep the law of Moses to be saved, and neither do uh, Jewish people either. But uh, in Acts 15, it specifically spoke about the Gentiles, that they were not to be put under the yoke of the law, that were under the new covenant, not the old covenant. The old covenant, which was uh, with Moses, with the sacrifice of animals, which only covered sin, could not erase sin, but the new covenant, which was through the blood of Jesus Christ, glory to God, erases our sin permanently by faith in his sacrifice on the cross and that he rose from the dead. And so James says, I am a servant of Jesus Christ by love. And this needs to be our motive for service for Christ, always. Not to glorify myself, not to glorify my ministry, but to glorify God, our Father in heaven. That is to be our motive, our love for people, our love for the lost. And we have to check our hearts. Do I have a competitive spirit? And I want to be clear, we need to get that out of the body of Christ. We are not in competition with one another. If God is blessing another ministry better than mine, and it's a good ministry, praise the Lord. That's a wonderful thing. And we're not in competition, and I can't do something I'm not called to do. We need to realize that, and that frees me, that gives me joy in my heart that I can win my own personal race which is with uh, the Lord to fulfill what God has called me personally to do. And I can have the same or more rewards as a pastor if I'm more faithful or as faithful as a pastor. And nobody is more important to God. We're all equal in Christ. And the thing that I love is also that James did not say, I'm the brother Jesus and you're not. <laughs> He didn't try to use his position and power and striving and straining for position. No, like politics in so many churches or so-called ministries that are really businesses and, and jockeying for position and they'll step on you to get higher. No, he believed God. He just served God. He loved God and God promotes in his timing. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up to what he wants to do. And so it's such a wonderful thing that James says, I am a bondservant of Jesus Christ out of love for him. And we're to have the servant's heart, just like Jesus, his wonderful example when he got down on his knees and he was washing the disciples' feet. God Almighty on his knees washing the disciples' feet. And how can I or how can you ever say, oh, that job is beneath me. I'm not doing that. I'm too important. I'm too big. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> that's not my ministry, that's yours. I'm not going to help with that. No, we are to be servants of Jesus Christ, bond servants of Jesus Christ. And this letter, it says, written to the dispersed, the scattered uh, 12 tribes. And they're not lost, by the way. God knows exactly where they are. <laughs> and so, uh, anyways, um, it's a beautiful example. Be a servant. Be a servant uh, of Jesus Christ. That is the example that we are to follow in Christ's example. James 1, 2 through 4 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And so what it says here is that I'm supposed to count it joy when I have really bad problems and trials. Woohoo! Can I have more? Can I have more? Just like potato chips. Can I have some more, please? <laughs> have you reached that point? I haven't. I'm, I'm better than I used to be, but still not there. But the wonderful thing about trials is that God does send them. Realize that. But he sends them for our good. And if we continue in faith and trusting in Christ, even though I don't understand many times all the things that are happening to me, and I look at the cross and I realize he loves me so much that he suffered for me, and if I keep trusting in him, then my faith will grow. And it says here that it produces patience. And why is that? Because many times we're like, Okay, I got this faith thing wired, and it's been two whole weeks, and I'm doing good. Wait a minute, it's been three weeks. Uh oh, it's been a year. Whoa, uh, Lord, where are you? And then we have to finally realize, uh-oh, 
I got to surrender everything to Christ. If he wants it to continue, then praise the Lord. If, if he wants it to end, praise the Lord. And I need, need to surrender my will to his will. Even he, even if he wants me to continue being sick or if he wants to heal me and let patience have it, have its perfect work. That's what that means. Because if you try to escape and you get, a lot of people get mad and they think they're punishing God. Well, I'm not going to church anymore. I'm punishing you, God. Well, you're punishing yourself. Uh, that, that's deception. Uh, God is my lifeline. He is my life and, and the Bible is my life. If you do that, you're following the devil and you'll fall down to the bottom. Don't do that. Stay close to Christ. When the trials get worse, pray more. When they get worse, read the Bible more. Uh, you need to uh, give your will to the Lord more um, anytime as things get worse and worse. And do not let up your closeness to Jesus Christ because that is exactly what the devil wants to do to you. And so that's a very big key. Don't make time a limiting factor. Well, Lord, I only trust you if it's two months or if it's two years. No, we, we have to surrender all to Christ. Whatever you will, Lord, I trust you. I look at the cross. I trust you. I don't understand. And sometimes we get confused and we say, Lord, I, it doesn't line up with your promises. I don't understand. We'll search the scriptures more. Make sure that you have right doctrine. Tragically, many people go to churches that teach false doctrine. They teach that God will always make you rich and always wants to make you rich and always heal. That's not true. And many people's faith has been made shipwreck because they are following false teachers. So be careful and uh, let patience have its perfect work in your life. And then your faith will grow and then you'll have joy and love and peace as you surrender to Christ and you praise him in the midst of the trials. And we all blow it and we say, Lord, please forgive me. I blew it. I'm sorry. I repent. It's my fault. And then God will say, of course, of course he will. And of course, it's better that we don't do that all the time. <laughs> but we can still say, Lord, I repent again. And the Lord will say, of course, I love you. I will help you. Of course, just don't justify everything. And, and uh, that just is not the right route to go. Because if you justify yourself, God cannot justify you. Um, and so trials can give me joy because I look at what they produce, the fruit that they produce, love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, kindness, brokenness, and a trusting in God that's at a deeper level, no matter what my circumstances are, that I have a deeper level of commitment, a deeper level of surrender of my heart to Jesus Christ. And this is also the way that God prepares people for ministry, by the way. Um, I would love it if you were just born again and uh, I'm ready for everything. Uh, it doesn't work that way. He has to train us and give us trials and tribulations. And we have to study the word and pray and, and get trained just like anything. And as we grow in Christ and surrender and love people, even when they don't deserve it, that is what God teaches us. And we learn patience and surrender and, uh, let patience have its perfect work, which means let the trial have its completion. And as the Nebuchadnezzar put uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, what did they say to Nebuchadnezzar? They said, God can deliver us, but if not, we will not bow down to you, Nebuchadnezzar, nor your statue. And so we have to surrender to God's will and not put limits on them and surrender to God's will. Of course, we do our best. Uh, we pray that God will heal us or whatever the trial is. We ask God what he wants us to do, but we surrender to what God says. And just as Jesus said in the Garden of Eden, thy will be done. We need to do the same thing. Thy will be done because you are God and I'm not. And so many times we start to give God advice, no? <laughs> When I really think about that, I really start to laugh, you know. I'm a flea on top of a flea giving God advice. You know, Lord, I really think you should be doing it this way. <laughs> no, I don't think so. God Almighty and, and God's like, oops, yeah, you're right. I blew it. Sorry about that. I should have listened to you, Ken. <laughs> oh, no, it doesn't work that way. God knows everything. He loves you. He thinks about it eternity and mind and and that's how he does his decisions based upon his infinite knowledge and we live by faith we live not by sight we live by trust 
in Jesus Christ, that he's in control, that he loves me. And then I can have peace and joy in my trials. When I stop trying to manipulate and strive and strain to make things happen the way that I think they should happen, we do, we do our best, but that's not the same thing as manipulation and striving and straining. That's different because that's the work of the flesh. And so, and the other thing that's very important that we will see is that if I finally surrender, well, then I can have wisdom and I'm not thrown around in the storm all the time. And one minute I have faith and one minute I don't. And that's what this next passage speaks about in James 1, 5 through 8. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. Ooh, I love this. Do you need wisdom? I do. <laughs> Every day. And the older you get, the more you realize you know nothing. I mean, God knows absolutely everything. And so the disparity between my mind and God's is infinite. <laughs> and so it's just foolishness not to seek God's wisdom in everything. He knows everything. And I love it that he says liberally, which means he'll give you whatever you need, whatever quantity, without reproach. He won't make fun of you. He won't say, hey, Ken, you asked me that yesterday. I'm not going to tell you again. Forget it. No, without reproach. And it will be given to him, but let him ask in faith without doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And so we are to ask for wisdom every day, all the time, in everything, God's will. In Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. And what does that mean? That means I don't lean on my own understanding, my own mind. I do my best, but I can't lean on that because I don't know much. <laughs> we don't know anything, so we do our best, but we don't lean our own minds. We lean on Christ and we seek wisdom, and we trust in him to guide me. Even though I can't see anything, I say, Lord, I know that you're guiding me. I can't see anything, but I trust you because I live by faith, not by sight. And so it says here, without reproach and in faith, without doubting. Now, how does this work, actually? Well, think about it. Why won't I receive anything from the Lord if I doubt? Well, first of all, we need to receive what God promises by faith. That we do need to do. But if I don't believe, or if I'm in rebellion against God, or if I'm not obeying God, and I've, I have one foot in the world and one foot in the church, and I'm not going to be able to hear what God wants me to do. For instance, let's say you're a man and, you, and there's a pretty girl in the church and you want, you want to ask her out. Well, if you're in the flesh and you're not obeying God, you're not walking with God, you're not going to care if she's spiritual. You're not going to be able to hear God say, well, that girl is not good. She doesn't uh, really love me or she's not even really saved. You're not going to hear because you're going to be like, oh, she's so pretty, though. That's all that matters. Well, that's not smart. And the same thing with girls. They do it all the time. That guy's so handsome and tall and big muscles. And oh, yeah, that's him. And and if she's not walking with the Lord and he's not, they're not going to hear the wisdom of the Lord because he will say, not now. And you might want to say, well, I want it to be now. And you can't hear. You can't receive the wisdom of God. Same thing with a job or whatever. Is your heart ready to receive what God wants to tell you or not? Or are you mad at God? Are you blaming God? And when we doubt, God, sometimes I'm mad, sometimes I'm not, sometimes I trust, sometimes I don't. We need to repent of that. That makes, that makes life very difficult. It's like a storm. I get thrown that way. I get thrown that way in the winds and I get thrown that way. Oh, I believe. Oh, I don't believe. Oh, I'm mad at God. Oh, I'm not mad at God. Oh, I go to church. Oh, I don't go to church. I'm mad about this trial. I'm not mad about. That's a very difficult life. We need to surrender to Christ, read the Bible, look at the cross that he loves me, that he cares about me, that he has a purpose in everything, and we need to trust him. And then I have peace, and then I realize, you know, Lord, I don't understand, but I know you love me. I look at how much you suffered for me on the cross, how they hit you and put a crown of thorns on your head, and how they, uh, they beat your back until it was just bloodied 
and how they put you on a cross. I look at how the Father loved us so much to send His Son that He suffered too because He saw His Son on the cross. And I trust you, Lord, though I don't understand what's going on. And forgive me, Lord. And, and I surrender my life again to you. And I repent again. And the Lord says, of course, and I'll help you. And be honest with God. He loves you. Say, Lord, I'm struggling. Help me. Help me, Lord. And he will. He loves you. He will. He is faithful. And so God wants us to ask for wisdom. And he will give liberally. And he will not make fun of me. And I, if I trust in him and I'm not doubly minded, which means one foot in the world and one foot in the church, and sometimes I believe and sometimes I don't, and that's what makes me unstable and that's what makes my life like a storm and my stomach is churning as I'm going back and forth. And But no, I trust you, Lord. I have peace in my heart. I have joy and I, I pray more. I read the Bible more. I'm always saying at least pray half an hour a day, at, um, at least uh, read the Bible a half an hour a day as well, or listen to a good Bible study every day. Serve the Lord every day. Obey Him every day. And if you can do that more, great. Uh, that's even better. And it's not that we deserve anything, it's that He's our lifeline. I get washed in the Word. and When I'm in the Word, my mind becomes clear and it washes away the lies. And I'm with Christ and I get filled full of His Spirit, full of joy. And pray in faith, Lord, fill me with your spirit. And by faith, I receive him because he is a promise. He is a promise for a Christian, for all Christians. And so we have to receive his promises by faith. He promises wisdom. And so I say, Lord, I need wisdom and what to do about my job or whatever. And I do receive by faith that promise because you promised. It's not doubtful. It's true. You promised wisdom. And then I receive by faith, and I believe that he is giving it to me now. And the same thing in ministry, if you're preparing for a job or whatever, if you know it's his will, you must receive it by faith and believe that you have received. If you don't know his will, well, then just trust in his love. Just trust in his love. God is faithful. Continuing in James 1, 9 through 11, it says, Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his hu humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. Its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes, so that the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. And so scripture does not teach that rich people are better than the poor or better than the middle class. Um, scripture does not teach that. God does not look at people that way. Uh, you can be poor and very spiritual. You can be poor and not spiritual. You can be rich spiritual and you can be poor. Uh, you can be rich and very spiritual if you're using your gifts for the kingdom of God, not just for yourself. And so don't trust in riches. Don't trust in those things. Trust in Jesus Christ. And I'm always telling people, think about it logically. It does not make sense to live for this short life, which is, who knows? It might be tomorrow when the Lord comes back. It sure seems like it's close, but we do not know the day nor the hour. But we can know the times and the seasons. And I'm so busy thinking about, oh, I got to have that car, and I got to have that house, and I got to have those shoes, and I got to... Well, we need to live, of course, but think about that compared to eternity. And as I'm always saying, you can send it ahead. <laughs> you can. Uh, if you serve the Lord with the right motive, and you serve the Lord because you love God, and you want to bless God's people and reach the lost, and you're not doing it for yourself or for the glory of man, but you're doing it for the glory of God, God gives us reward in heaven. You can send it ahead. It is not wise to think about this short life compared to eternity. It just is not wise. And especially for the lost who uh, think that they're doing so well, they have riches, but it is so short and then they will go to hell. Look at the example that Jesus gave, which is so heavy. In Luke 12, 16 through 21, it says, Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? 
I got so much money, I don't know what to do with it. I got that problem. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I have no room to store my crops. So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Wow, can't, how, how incredibly strong that is from the Lord. Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. This night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Wow, that is heavy. And I also want to emphasize that uh, we are all equal in Christ. If, if you're faithful and your calling primarily is to pray alone in your house, and you're more faithful in doing that than a pastor is what his calling is, you can have more reward in heaven than the pastor. It's whatever we are called to do, and we are all equal in Christ. That's a pretty heavy thing about riches that we see here. Store them up in heaven, not for the short life. Use them for the ministry. Of course, take care of your family, but use what you have been given by God, your gifts for the kingdom of God. And it's a, it's a trap. It's a trap. My mind always needs to be focused on eternity, on eternity. That is what matters. And think about it. It's terribly selfish, too. There are people that were, uh, are all around us, and they're going to hell. And I'm worried about, well, you know, my couch is getting kind of old. I'm getting upset. Well, God wants to bless us, but we need to have the right priorities in life. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And I love this. If we have victory over sin, God also gives us reward in heaven. And what a, what a beautiful thing. He rewards us when we resist temptation in the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and the only way we will have victory is with the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, pray, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your power in faith. And stay in the word. Stay strong in the word. Study a lot. Pray a lot. Resist temptation when it comes in the power of the Holy Spirit. And God will give you the victory. And also know that to love God is to obey Him. So many times people think primarily love is just hugs and kisses. Oh, I love you, I love you. No, that's not number one. Number one is deciding to obey God, deciding to love people. And these are not my words, they're the Lord's. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, of course, there is the lovey-dovey side. <laughs> there is uh, that side of it, the hugs and the kisses, but it starts out with a decision. If, if my love is only based upon my feelings, well, those go up and down and up and down, don't they? Uh, James 1.13 says, Let no one say he is tempted. I am tempted by God. God does not tempt us with evil. He will never send a woman to go tempt a man uh, to commit sin or to commit adultery. God does not do that. The devil and, and the flesh and evil men and women do that. God does not. God will send us trials. That does happen. But his purpose is for our good, uh, to, to purify our faith, to bless our walk with him, our trust in him. But the devil does send temptations for us to sin. And so again, it says, let no one say he is tempted. I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil. And I also want to be clear that being tempted is not sin. When you fall into temptation, that is sin. The devil tempted Jesus, but he did not sin and cannot sin. And so continuing in this verse, it says, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. And so, this gives uh, the steps to sin. 
it's an interesting thing how it is put here. Uh, it talks about conception, it talks about desire, it talks about getting closer, and then it talks about a birth, and then it talks about full grown. So these are the steps of a life. And so what does this tell me? This, this tells me to stay far away from sin. Don't get close. So many people say, well, is it okay if I get really close to this sin and I'm still not sinning? Is that okay? Well, that's very dangerous. You're putting yourself in a position that you can sin. If you stay far away from sin, temptations of sin, the odds of you uh, falling into it are far less, far less. And so, but you know how it is. If you get too close, if you, here's a practical example. You, for, you refuse to forgive someone and you've got that in your heart and you're very close to sin. You're angry and it's building and you ref refuse to forgive. And, and then you see that person and it's building and building. Well, then you might say some things that you shouldn't say because you're getting very close. Or you may do worse things. You may hit someone. So we have to forgive. We have to obey God. Stay far away from sin. Otherwise, it will grow until it's born. And it gives the example of being full grown. What does that mean? Well, if you continue in sin your entire life, it leads to death. What is that? Spiritual death can be physical death as well. But if you live in sin, you are not a Christian. You cannot live in sin and be a real Christian. That's what scripture teaches us in 1 John. Now, a real Christian can fall into sin and say, Lord, please forgive me, help me. Of course. But to live in sin without conviction and justifying it, that gives birth to death. And the stages are is that conception and then birth and then growing and then full grown and then death and then spiritual death. So the question isn't so much, is this sin? The question is, does this please Jesus? Is this something that he would want me to do? And so stay far away from sin. And there's such a ridiculous uh, carnal movement right now saying, well, let's let people get as close as possible and that'll make it easier for them to get into heaven. You know, that that's how it'll work. No, that's a, a lie from the devil. Um, many people are teaching it's okay to drink and it's okay to watch bad things and it doesn't matter if you have liberty. No, the Bible teaches we have liberty not to sin not to sin, not liberty to sin, but liberty not to sin. Don't get close to that. That's a different gospel when you're teaching people to sin, to try to get saved. That's a false gospel. And we are free in Christ not to sin. And that's a major blessing. Stay far away. Don't play with sin. That's what uh, Samson did. Kept playing with sin until he was totally blind, had his eyes taken out. What a tragic thing. James 1.16 says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And so what we see here is all good things come from God and all bad things come from the flesh, sin, and the devil. And so God wants to bless us with an abundant life, with a blessed life. Um, and that we receive that by walking with Jesus Christ. And sin leads to pain. It leads to death. And when we obey God, it's not that we deserve to be blessed. We never are. We're just putting ourselves in a position to be more able to be blessed. Um, there are so many examples of that. If you're a good example of Jesus Christ in your work, you do a good job, and people see that you're a Christian, then they'll say, wow, Christians are good people. I think maybe I'll go check out that church and see what this God is all about. But if you're lazy, you're like, dee, 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 they don't pay me enough, so I'm not working. <laughs> uh, you're not going to have a good witness and God can't use you much. It has nothing to do with what we deserve and what we don't deserve. We never deserve anything, but we're not in a position for God to use me that much. And that's how it works. We are to be faithful. We're to be fruitful in the power of the Holy Spirit. And sin is painful. We need to understand that. And God can heal our pain, but we need to repent. Uh, James 1.18 says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. I love that. 
That's basically saying that God created me to be his friend. We're the first fruits of his creatures. He loves me. He wants to walk with me. He wants to be my best friend. He calls us the bride of Christ. He wants to spend eternity with us. Would you want to spend eternity with you? <laughs> or with me? <laughs> wow, God has wonderful love for us, doesn't he? What a wonderful thing. And so what we see here is that we are his creatures brought forth by truth. By the word of God, we are born again through faith, through faith. And God is the creator. He said, let there be light. And God said that all was good that he created. And so what a beautiful thing. And God loves us. He created us. We're all equal in Christ. There is no Jew. There is no Gentile. We are all one in Christ. There is no place for racism. God created us all in his image. And we have different roles many times in church and life, but God looks at us all as equal in Christ through Christ. James 1.19 says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Boy, is this something we need to learn, no? You have a problem, you get into an argument, and you know, you think, oh, I gotta win. I gotta win. It's like a boxing match, and I gotta win. What can I say? What can I say? How can I win? Don't fall into that trap of the flesh. Just stop and pray and keep your mouth shut, and I need to keep my mouth shut, and we need to pray and wait on the Lord how he would fix the situation, or if he wants me even to say anything at all or if he wants me to uh, use someone else to help fix the situation, or he may want me to keep my trap shut, my mouth shut the entire time. And be slow to speak and slow to anger, because then you have time to pray and wait on the Lord and decide. And if people insist on yelling at you, it takes two to fight. You don't have to yell back and just say, I'm going to pray and let's talk about this later. And that is wisdom. Wait, wait, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. The devil so much wants us to get into the flesh so that we'll say whatever he puts into our heads because we're too mad or too sad or whatever. God is faithful. We must wait on the Lord and ask God to help us during those times. Scripture even teaches that those who can keep their mouth shut are mighty. Isn't that interesting? You're mighty if you can keep your mouth shut, if you can keep your temper under control. No, I'm not talking about people that are very timid, that never say anything. Of course, they, all, they never say anything. I'm speaking of people that do speak and that do open their mouths. And there is a time when we should, and there is a time that we shouldn't. And frankly, it's probably more often that we shouldn't, especially when it's not the way that God would have us to do it. It says in Proverbs 16, 32, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Wow. And he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. That's amazing. And so we need to understand that. We need to understand that scripture also says a soft answer breaks a bone. Uh, a soft answer turns away wrath. It says in Proverbs 25, 15, by long forbearance, a ruler is persuaded and a gentle tongue breaks a bone. Wow, this is so different than the world. And so don't let the devil draw you into the flesh that you're in a yelling match and going back and forth and trying to win. And you don't win that way. You lose and you say things you wish you had never said. And then you have to pray, Lord, please help me uh, fix this situation. And we continue in verse 21. James 1.21 says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. And so what the Lord is saying here through uh, James is that we are to remove the evil of the world from our lives and replace it with things uh, that are spiritual, such as the word of God. Many times we have to look at the things in our lives and decide, oops, I better get rid of that and get rid of that, and I better replace it with that. I better replace uh, uh, my uh, music collection that's of the world and, and put Christian music, and you should do that, by the way. God created music for him. Um, uh, think about the lyrics of the world and people who justify and say, well, I have liberty. You don't have liberty to sin. 
And, and again, it's a carnal movement. They say, well, come on over to my house. And, you know, I have liberty in Christ and I've got my brewski out and I, I've got my, uh, my uh, mu music of the world out. And wow, we have such liberty. No, the Bible says we're to be salt and light. Salt hurts. Salt heals. Light exposes. What happened when uh, the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said, how can I get into heaven? We didn't say, well, let's pray right away. No problem. You have liberty. Uh, let's pray right away. No, he said, you have to sell everything that you have because money is your God. He made it harder to make sure that he was truly ready to be saved. And many people think that we make it easier is the way to go. It is not. Of course, it has to be biblical doctrine, of course. But to make it sinful, to make it easier? No, that is not biblical. We are to lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word. And that means I receive the word of God with humility, that I want to obey it, that I apply it to my life, that I resist evil, that which is filthy. And through the word of God is how I was saved, by faith, in the word of God, in Christ's death and resurrection from the cross, that he died for my sins and he rose from the dead. And not to look at the word with pride and think, well, you know, I've already read it three times and I've seen so many pastors fall. I've seen so many pastors fall into false doctrine after they've been walking with the Lord for a long time. You can never, never, never trust in the strength of your flesh, ever. My flesh will always want to do that which is evil until I go to be with the Lord. It will never change. And so the fight never ends until the end. What did Paul say? He said, I fought the good fight. It's a fight. It's a spiritual battle. And we must use spiritual weapons. And so many people don't treat it that way. And that is very, very dangerous. We only grow spiritually through the Word of God. We only win with spiritual weapons. James 1.22 says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. And so this is what happens when you get up in the morning. I get up in the morning and I look in the bathroom, I look in the mirror, and I see what... Ah! <laughs> I got to fix my hair and I got to wash my face. I'm dirty. got to brush my teeth. But if I look in the mirror and I say, oh, uh oh, big trouble. And I just walk outside and I don't do anything. Well, I'm going to be in trouble, right? <laughs> well, it's the same with the word of God. God convicts us. I go to a Bible study. God speaks to my heart. Well, if I don't do what God has convicted me of or how he's exhorted me or encouraged me, if I don't do those things, well, then I it's not... Uh, being useful at all. We are to be hearers and doers of the word of God. And it continues in verse, verse 24, for he observes himself, goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Again, the law of liberty is the law of liberty not to sin, not to sin. He has freed me from sin. He has given me the power of his Holy Spirit to repent. But we must resist sin. So many pastors say, well, you just got to let go and let God, you know, and uh, he'll do everything. And man, when I did that, I sinned more. <laughs> <laughs> a lot more. No, we have our part and God has his part. That's false teaching. We're supposed to read the Bible. We're supposed to pray. We're supposed to resist sin, serve Christ, obey him, love him, have faith. We have our part and resist sin and resist the devil and he shall flee from you and pray in faith for the power of his Holy Spirit. And then God will do his part. It's not that I lay on the couch and do nothing, and then God gives me victory. It doesn't work that way. That is a false teaching. And so we are to resist evil. We're to obey the Lord. We're to be doers of the word, not hearers only. I've heard so many people say, what conviction? Oh, man, I was so convicted. And I went home and, and they didn't change anything. Everything the same. That's a tragedy. Many times God is speaking to us for years. We need to repent. 
And that is how we ma mature in Jesus Christ. And tragically, so many Christians are still in their diapers and they've been a Christian for 30 years. Well, that's cute when you're first saved, <laughs> but not 30 years later. Nope. God help us. God help us. And so we are to obey what God puts into our hearts. We are to obey him. And it's a blessing to repent. I want to emphasize that. People that go to hell will never be able to repent. It's a blessing to be able to repent, to be like Jesus. And we all blow it. We say, Lord, please help me. Please help me. And, and we repent and take responsibility. And then God helps us. Glory to God. It's a blessing to obey God. And it's a blessing to walk with Jesus. And uh, it is such a deception to think that sin is a blessing because it's not. It's painful. It always leads to pain. And so that's the way it is. Uh, James 1.26 says, If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. And so if anybody thinks that they're religious, and that means if you're walking, thinks that they're walking with God or know God well and are obeying God, but they don't control their own tongues, it's deception because we can either bless people with our tongue or we can, we can uh, destroy them. We have to be careful and we have to say things to edify people. And even if it's uh, saying things to people to help them to repent, if God leads you, and by the way, that's only if God leads you. It's not a spiritual gift to constantly be going around telling everybody their sin. Some people think that's their gift. <laughs> no, that's not your gift. I mean, sometimes the Lord speaks to us to do that, but constantly, no, that's, that's your flesh. Um, and so how do we control our tongues? It's the same. Stay in the Word. Read the Bible a lot. Obey God. Listen to what the voice of God. Obey Him. Be in a lot of prayer, at least a half an hour of prayer a day alone with God. At least a half an hour in the Word of God every day or listening to a Bible study every day. Concentrating on the Word. Being filled with the Holy Spirit. Obeying God. Forgiving people. Loving people. Even though they don't deserve it. Making a decision to love people. Not emotions serving people, suffering harm, suffering wrong when it's God's will for that to happen. And let's give a practical example. Somebody does something that hurts a lot. Well, you need to forgive them. And you pray, Lord, help me. And you make the decision to forgive them. And then you pray for them. Um, and then you, uh, you keep your mouth shut, as it says in this uh, uh, chapter. And many times we have to suffer harm. And as God leads. Sometimes God would have us to do something. It depends on the situation. But vengeance is the Lord. We're never to seek vengeance. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That's what God says. So seeking vengeance or revenge, we are never to do that. That's God's place. James 1.27 says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And so I love it again that James is so practical. He says, well, you know, if you really love God and you really love his people and love the lost, well, you'll see fruit. We're not saved by good works, but you'll have good works if you truly are saved and you have love for God and for his people and for the lost in your heart. You'll visit orphans. You'll visit widows. You'll help people that are in need. You'll keep unspotted from the world. Again, so there's a carnal movement now that they think somehow it's more spiritual to be carnal. It is not. Well, I'll just drink my brewski and I'll put on my uh, heavy metal rock music of the world. And, you know, I, I you know, I, I'm not legalistic. I'm not religious. No, you're just carnal or you're not saved. I don't want to offend people, but that is just the way it is. Most of the people that I have seen that have that attitude, they only care about themselves. They don't care about hurting other Christians or being a bad witness. They really don't. They only care about their so-called liberty. You don't have liberty to sin. You have liberty not to sin in Jesus Christ. And that is such a blessing that we don't have to sin. Keeping ourselves unspotted from the world, visiting orphans. And I want to emphasize it's wonderful to visit orphans, but that's not the only thing. There are many, many, many ways you can serve Jesus Christ. Giving out tracts, uh, supporting the church, uh, serving in the church, being a wonderful example of Jesus Christ in your work. 
being a wonderful mother or father or husband and wife, being an example in everything and not feeling bad because I'm not uh, on the worship team or I'm not a pastor. We're all equal in Jesus Christ. We are a body. We have different callings and nobody is more important than others. And do as God leads and get the gospel out and get the word of God out and write doctrine. Those are so important. Time is short. And it seems that Jesus is coming is very soon, but again, we don't know the day nor the hour. And we're not to love this world. Scripture says that if you love this world, the love of the Father is not in you. Why is that? Because you're thinking more about this world than people's souls. Uh, you're thinking more about those things than eternity, than your neighbor or your family members that are going to hell. We have to have a, a love and a compassion for the lost. And that comes through staying close to Jesus Christ. And the love comes from him, not from me. And I have to keep that open in my heart and keep love in my heart through Jesus Christ, through prayer. And it's not so much that I decide, well, I'm going to be so loving today. Yeah, I'm going to be Mr. Loving. Yeah, that's it. No, it's more that I don't block it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to forgive and I have to uh, deny myself and I have to let other people be first and I have to uh, put my flesh down in, in prayer and a decision to resist evil and pray a lot and be in the Bible a lot and be filled with the Spirit and then His love can flow through me. And uh, that's more the way that it works. Not that I am deciding that I'm, well, I'm Mr. Loving Ken today. No, I need to let the Holy Spirit flow through me, the power of the Holy Spirit. It says in 1 John 2.15, Do not love the world, the things in this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Wow, that's amazing. That is incredible. And so... Does that mean that I can't love a beautiful sunset or something like that? Of course not. He's talking about the evil things of this world, the carnality of this world. Of course, you can love what God has done. He did it. In Matthew 5, uh, 13, it says, You are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its savor, its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing. It's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by man. What does that mean? That means if you're so carnal that salt no longer stings, it no longer heals, if people feel comfortable and they're cussing around you and they're just uh, drinking their brewskis and you're just like them, just like the world, well, then the salt has lost its flavor and the light no longer is there. And so we need to repent and we need to be apart from those things. Now, of course, we are to evangelize and we can have friends uh, in the world, but they're not to be our best friends. They're to be our friends in the sense that we want to evangelize them, not just to hang out. Because if you do that, you'll end up changing more and more carnal. Our best friends are to be Christians and uh, business partners and uh of course, marriage is supposed to be godly Christians. We're not to be unequally yoked. And Scripture says, what, what fellowship does light have with darkness? If you're comfortable with darkness, something is wrong. Maybe you're not saved. I was fake for a long time. I went to church and I believed, but then on the weekends I'd go partying with my friends. I wasn't saved, but I did believe. He, Jesus wasn't my Lord yet. Now, if you're listening, if someone is listening now and you're in that category and you haven't repented yet and Jesus is not your Lord, he's not your boss, you really don't live for him, you can repent today and invite him into your heart and make him your Lord, your Savior, which means uh, he will be your boss. You'll obey him. And, and Savior means that he will save you from your sins through his death on the cross for your sins and that he rose from the dead. And you can pray with me by faith, and you can be saved, and he'll come and live in your heart if you're sincere in your heart. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, I do believe that Jesus died for me on the cross and rose from the dead. I give you my life. I make you my Lord, my boss, and help me to repent of my sins. Fill me with your spirit. Forgive me for all that I've done in my life, Lord. Thank you for the gift of salvation that's by faith, that's not by works. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. And for us that are already Christians, help us, Lord, to walk with you, 
to trust you in the midst of our trials and tribulations, that we will grow in the faith and to be good examples of Christians everywhere, in the job, in the home, everywhere, Lord. Help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to resist temptation, to put off the evil things of this world. And we thank you for all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen.